Hello everyone, thanks for watching. This is Nathaniel Kramer, also known as Preaching Musician. And in this video, we're going to uh, be talking about the second part of this series, which is why do we need the gospel? And we're going to look at that from the perspective of God's existence and who God is. So we're going to get right to it. I'm going to be reading from Exodus chapter 34. And the reason why I've chosen this passage is because it literally has God introducing himself. And I know there's been many... There's been many theories on YouTube about who God is. Uh, some say that he's, he doesn't exist. Some say that he's, you know, some say that he's just, he's all in all and we're in him and he's in us and he's, yeah, God is everything and everything is God. And there's all kinds of weird theories out there and notions about who God is, but if we want to get down to it, God is the best person to define who he is. And if you don't believe that this book is the word of God, I have another series on that. On, uh, it's called How Do We Know That God Exists? So that we'll address that. We've already addressed that in another series. But this video uh, is about God and who He is. So in Exodus chapter 34, God is speaking to Moses uh, before He gives him, uh, for the second time, before He gives him the Ten Commandments. And we're going to start in verse 5. It says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and, procl and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, and unto the third and to the fourth generation. So here's God coming to Moses and saying, look, this is who I am. This defines me. So we're going to take this phrase by phrase and and just look at us for a little bit. First thing that God says, that the first thing that the Bible says he proclaims is the Lord. And that, that word is actually all capital letters. Anytime you see the Lord in all caps in the Old Testament, it's a reference to the, the tetragrammaton, Y-W-Y-H. And uh, there's no pronunciation for it. That's why I, didn't, I would have just given it to you if there was, but it's actually all vowels, so you can't pronounce it. And there's really no, no full explanation of it either. We know that the first time that this word was used is when God introduced himself to Moses as the I am. So some say that this word means that God is ever present, that God is with us, that God is in control, like, you know, that God's in the present. And that's, there's a lot of truth to that, and, and that's part of what he is. But I really believe that the reason why God chose a word that couldn't be pronounced or that couldn't be defined is because he wanted a word that was defined by his very nature. And maybe this isn't true, this might be just my theory, but... I think that it's going to take all eternity to truly understand what this word means. This word, Y-W-I-H, or capital Lord. And uh, he goes on from there. He says, the Lord, in all caps, and he says, the Lord God. I'm going to look at Isaiah chapter 6, because it gives us a glimpse into the throne room of God. Isaiah had just gone through a very tough time. His, his, one of the, a king who, who was very dear and close to him had just died. And he had a vision of God. And this is an amazing Amazing passage here. I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, In the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This gives us just a little, little insight of to who God is. And if you notice these seraphims who, with two wings, they cover their face, two their feet, two they flied. The reason they're covering their face and feet is because they were too ashamed. We're talking about these, these, uh, these people, these, they aren't people, they're, they're seraphims, but they're more powerful than, than even regular angels. When an angel one time dipped his wing to low, he killed over 100,000 people. These things are very powerful, very holy. But even before God, it's, it's like a grasshopper trying to say that he's, he's holy before God. It, 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 it might as well be because... There is no one like God. He is holy, holy, holy. There's a lot of things that define God. You know, we know that God is love. We know that God is good. 
But there is nothing that in the Bible that says that God is love, love, love. Nothing in the Bible says that God is good, good, good. He is those things, but the, but the only time that the word is mentioned three times like that, three times in a row, is when it says that God is holy. And when the Bible says that, and when God is described to Moses that he was the I am, I think the reason why is because, well, when we want to describe ourselves or someone else, we can always compare them with someone. Uh, like in basketball, if you wanted to find LeBron James, you could say he's a little bit like, oh, he's kind of like a mix between Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan. You know, there's a lot of those, those, de- those ways that we compare players and compare different people. We can compare different objects. But when God tried to explain himself to Moses, when he tried to define who he was to Moses in an earlier passage in Exodus, he doesn't say, I'm like the seraphims. I'm like the angels. I'm like this person. I'm like that person. No, he just had to say, I am the I am. Because there is no one like God. No one that even comes close. So God is, he is the God, the only God, and there is none like him. He is the Lord God. But he takes a different direction from there. He goes on and he says, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. So this holy God who sits high upon the throne and rules over everything, and created everything, he's merciful, he's gracious. That word merciful in the Hebrew has a connotation of compassion. And if we read the New Testament, we know uh, that Jesus, he looked over the multitude and he, and he had compassion on them because they were scattered about, about as sheep having no shepherd. And, and that meaning literally means that, that Jesus looked into the eyes of those people and he saw in the hearts of those men and women, he saw the suffering, he saw the pain, he, he saw the turmoil that they were going through. And he, and he literally, he felt those things with them. And that's what God's talking about when he said, says that he is merciful. It literally means that God is feeling what we feel. He is, he's understanding with us. He's, he's there with us. And his heart is, is, is breaking as we break. And I can go into, into that for a, a long way. And it has that meaning of compassion. But it also has another meaning. It means that God doesn't give us what we deserve. And uh, in the last video, we talked about how, what our condition is and why we deserve hell. But God doesn't have to give it to us because He's merciful. And, and that mercy is so great. But He goes on from there. He says He's merciful and gracious. And that gracious means it's kind of a, a different side of mercy. It's when God gives, God gives us what we don't deserve. And the, Lord, Lord, the word literally means something to be grateful for, um, something to, be, uh, to have gratitude towards. So when you've got to be grateful for something, it's because you didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. And that's the idea there. God is merciful to us. God is gracious to us. And he's also long-suffering. That's the next word in this passage. And that word literally means that he's slow to flare his nostrils. He's slow to anger. He doesn't, it, it takes him a long time before he actually comes down on his wrath. And man, aren't we grateful for that? And he goes, and again, he reiterates that later. But before he does, he says that he's abundant in goodness and truth. And the word good is actually just a derivative of God. When we talk about that God is good, many people try to debate that. They try to say God's not good. He sends people to hell. He can't be good. God's not good. He allows, he allows people to be sick. But literally, the word good comes from God. God defines what is good. His very nature is the definition of good. So when we talk about, when God says that he is good, that's, that's, that's like a given. But then he goes on to the next part, and he says that he is full, he's abundant in goodness and truth. And that is a word that is sorely, lack, sorely lacking in our society today. When the Bible t- talks about truth, it's not talking about some abstract or relative thing. It's not talking about, you got your truth, I got my truth, and you know, as long as you got your beliefs and my beliefs, it doesn't matter if we believe different things, we're both right. You, know, you can think 2 plus 2 is 3, you can think 2 plus 2 is 5, it's all good because you got your own truth. And honestly, that, that's, that's ridiculous, and we, we have, that's another debate for another time, but God says, look, I am truth. I am not just truth, I am abundant in truth. So he says he's good, he's full of goodness, he's full of truth. And further, he continues and he reiterates his mercy. It says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. So the beginning of that verse, he says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. 
So those three things are actually three different, uh, three different ways you can do wrong. The idea here, here is that God, for thousands of people, God forgives every kind of wrong they can do. And that's a wonderful thing that we have a God that does that. But then on the other hand, he, he says, that, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So here's a God who says, I'm full of mercy. I'm full of grace. And I forgive sin. I forgive iniquity. I forgive transgression. I forgive all kinds of things. But on the other hand, I don't clear the guilty. I just don't do it. Now, how do we reconcile those two things? How do you have a God who's merciful on one hand, and on the other hand, He's just, He's holy, He's righteous. And anyone who stands in His way and becomes the enemy of God, that person is demolished. And, and rightfully so. He's God. I'm going to look at a passage, and, uh, and we're going to... We're gonna, uh, I'm gonna th we'll talk about this a little bit, and that'll be the end of this video. But I want you to think about this. You, you don't want a God who's not just. You don't want a God who, who just lets things go no matter what happens. We see here in Proverbs chapter 17, it says, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the ju just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. And the idea of abomination, it's, the, it's one of the most repugnant words that the Bible uses. It literally means that God wants to spew you out or throw you up. And, and it, when he talks about things that are disliked in the Bible, there's hatred, there's the word eschew, and then the word abomination is way up there. So when the Bible uses the word abomination, it means that I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a word that's just the most grotesque word I can come up with, so I'm going to put abomination in here. And that, that's what it literally means. But think about that. It, let's say that you were uh, coming home one day and you caught somebody in the act of murdering you know, a dozen people that you love, maybe your family, maybe your, maybe your close friends. And later you're in court and there he is sitting across the room from you and, and a judge says, oh, I'm a loving judge. I, I'm merciful and gracious, forgiving iniquity for thousands and, 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 and the, I'm going to let this guy go free. What would you say about a judge like that? I know if it was me, I, I'd be calling everybody I could, trying to, trying to rally up the people to get this guy off the bench. Because it's an unjust judge. It would make me so angry if somebody did that. But think about this. If, that, if we have a right to judge like that, if we have a right to say, you need to judge justly, you need to, be, you need to work, uh, have justice, how much more does God say, look, anybody who condemns the righteous and anybody who justifies the wicked, they just make me sick. They, wanna, they make me want to throw up. So we got a problem here. How can God be just and merciful at the same time? That's a big question. In fact, I've, I've looked at many different religions. I've read the Quran, the Kabbalah, and I've looked into Buddhism, all this stuff. and No religion answers this question. And many, even derivatives of Christianity, they, they don't claim that they, they, they may claim that there is, but by definition of what they believe, they don't really believe that God is just and merciful. I mean, the Quran, it even says that, that, that God is, that Allah is the most merciful, most gracious. But that's just, it doesn't work. I mean, they, he sends people to hell because he's just. But on the other time, somehow he's merciful. And the two just don't go together. And this is the great issue of the scriptures. This is the reason why we have the gospel. And so in my next video, please, please stay tuned for next week because I'm going to be answering this question. How can God be just? How can God be righteous? How could God be holy, but at the same time extend mercy to sinners like us? To look at somebody who has defied the very purpose of their existence, to look at somebody who has rebelled against the holy righteousness of God, and be merciful to them, while at the same time being just. You may look at that and be like, well, that's just not possible. Well, gratefully, we have an answer in the Bible. God has given us the remedy for this issue. So please, next, next week I'm going to probably do the most important video I'll ever do. Please watch next week. Thank you so much for watching this. I know that these two videos have been kind of negative. I promise you next video will be very positive. We're, we're going to get to the good part of the message. So thank you again for watching and God bless you.